Ancient texts, cryptic numbers, symbolic imagery depicting awesome apocalyptic events. For many, the Bible and its prophecies seem shrouded in mystery. Words like Armageddon and tribulation frighten millions, while others wonder how to avoid the mark of the beast or being left behind when the Lord returns. Can we understand the Bible? Yes. And Jesus holds your key to unlock a future without fear. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents The Prophecy Code with Doug Batchelor. Today's study, USA in Bible Prophecy. Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to another very informative evening here at the Prophecy Code in Silver Spring, Maryland. We're thankful that you have been faithful every night to open your Bible, sit down, and relax as we open the Word of God and open our hearts for the Spirit of God to speak to us. Tonight's topic is the United States in Bible prophecy. As you've been following, we've been covering some very heavy topics, but the Spirit of God is able to plant the seed, and as we listen to the voice of God, we are able to move forward as we follow all of the subjects from night to night. So wherever you're joining us from, welcome once again for a very spirit-filled, Bible-based, exciting evening. And I encourage you, if you have any questions or any comments you'd like to send to us, go to the internet website, prophecyco.net.org or .com and post your questions. And if you want to get the Bible topics that have been covered by Pastor Bachelor every night, there's a toll-free number that you can call to get uh, whatever Bible folder that was covered, Amazing Facts folder. The phone number is 1-800-538-7275. That's once again, 1-800-538-7275. And I understand you can get at a special price in bulk rate or a different price if you're buying small quantities. I want to invite someone that is a very good friend of mine. His name is Jim Gilly. He's the vice president of the North American Division. Tonight, let's warmly welcome him as he comes tonight and grants us our prayer. Let's welcome him tonight. Good evening, and it's good to be with you tonight. And I see so many people here that that I've known and been with in other places and other meetings. And uh, we welcome you, of course, and we welcome those that are watching by television all over the world. This broadcast is going literally all around the world. And I've been hearing from groups. I heard from a group today, a small group. You know, sometimes there are large groups, large churches, large auditoriums, even some stadiums where these, this is being shown. But there are small groups that are meeting. And I heard from one today from Dyersburg, Tennessee, via Road. And we just welcome that group here tonight uh, as they join us by television. And uh, we welcome you as well. Let's stand together as we have our prayer tonight. Our Father and our God, we thank you tonight for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the truth of your word. And Father, we know that down through the ages, people have been willing to die for truth. We thank you for those who have been willing to die for truth. And now, Father, we live in a time where we must live for truth where we must stand for it. We may not be asked to die for it in some countries of this world, but, Father, we pray that you'll give us the courage to stand for truth and to stand with you and to talk about your Son who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In his wonderful name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. He said, when you introduce me, introduce me as someone who loves the Lord, and it's evident that his heart is filled with the love of the Lord. I'd like to welcome a few very important uh, networks for making these meetings possible. I'd like to welcome Hope Channel, ATN, 3ABN, and Red Avenir for their united effort in joining together to get this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ around the world, without which... It would not be possible. Thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. And friends, tonight, join me as we welcome our presenter once again, Pastor Doug Batchelor, the president and director and speaker of Amazing Facts. Amen. Thank you, John. Hello. Good evening. Thank you so much once again for coming. 
We have a very important presentation tonight. I want to welcome our friends who are watching around the country and around the world. Well, we're going to see how many questions we can get through tonight. And so now it's time for our Bible questions. Last night we were talking about adding up names. And you said some, somebody's going to email your name added up, and they did. And you are in trouble. Any guesses? <laughs> it's not 666, but it's 555. Five, five. <laughs> so someone must know your middle name, and I didn't tell them. Our first question is this. Why do people not use the personal name of God, Yahweh? I think God made it very clear, especially in the Old Testament, that his name was very important and must be remembered and used by his people. Well, I think we should treat the name of God uh, ex with extreme reverence, higher than any other name. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, God says, I have exalted my word even above my name. So the main thing to exalt is the word of God. God goes by many, many names in the Bible. Uh, one of the most common names that some translate Yahweh, we're not even... Uh, exactly sure how to say that because it was such a sacred name for the Jewish people whenever it came time to uh, write that name they would write in they'd put a pen down they'd take a special pen to write the name of God and then they would write in maybe just the consonants the tetragametron and uh, they wouldn't speak it and so we speculate some say Yahweh some say Jehovah they're not even sure um, the main thing is God wants us to address him as our Lord, that we know who he is. There are some people you might know their name, but you don't know them. I think it's really important to know who he is. The names of the Lord in the Bible, he is called the El Shaddai, Yahweh, Jehovah is one of the names, the Almighty. He, in the New Testament, Jesus goes by the I Am he is the bread. He is the good shepherd. Matter of fact, I think in Revelation, there are about 50 different names for Jesus that are used. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lamb, and so forth. And so God, his personality is so broad that it's like a multifaceted jewel. He has many names that describe different attributes of who he is. If I'm interested in baptism, how do I proceed? Well, if you're, if you're watching with one of our groups... I hope that you will go to the group leader, most of them I'm sure have identified themselves, and express that you have an interest in being baptized or rebaptized. We have a study that will touch on that coming. And uh, we'll be having, want to hear something exciting? We have some that have already asked about baptism here. We're going to have, God willing, a baptism in connection with this meeting. Isn't that neat? So we're looking forward to witnessing the fruits of people with the Holy Spirit working in their lives. But uh, uh, as soon as you make a decision for baptism, it doesn't mean you need to be baptized right away. Baptism is something like a wedding in that you prepare, you plan, you study. It's a very serious commitment of committing your life to Jesus. Will there be any more prophets before Jesus comes? And how can we know if someone is a true prophet? Good question. Matthew 24, Jesus warns us to be on guard against false Christs and false prophets. And the reason for that is that somewhere there probably are going to be what? True prophets. Jesus would never tell us to worry about the false prophets if, if there weren't going to be true prophets. Before the Lord has ever done anything significant in history, he always calls a prophet. Is that right? And here we are on the verge of the second coming, Joel chapter 2. It shall come to pass in the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy. prophesy. So will there be prophets in the last days? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 14, prophecy is one of the gifts of the church. Do we still need the gifts of the church? Mm -hmm. So, but test the prophets with the biblical test. Make sure they follow the Bible. Amen? So that you need to test what they say. And if it goes along with the Bible, it, then sure you know. Make sure there's nothing in their lives that conflicts with the Bible or in their teachings. So That's we have to look at test. them more closely than just what they say, but what they do. And make sure their prophecies come true. Sometimes these prophets, they say, well, I get 50% right. Are Bible prophets like that? No. In Romans chapter 14, it states not to regard one day above another. Could you give some insight to this? Well, I'll do my best. Some people have looked at, uh, when they hear the Sabbath truth, they say, oh, but what about what Paul says in Romans 14? Doesn't that say it doesn't matter what day you keep? Let's read this together. If you go to chapter 14 of Romans, I'll start with verse 5. Oh, I'm going to start with verse 4. 
Who are you that judges another servant? To his own master he stands or fall, falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. Then he goes on and says, He who eats, eats to the Lord, and he gives God thanks, so forth. Uh, the word Sabbath doesn't appear anywhere in the chapter. Paul is a, the big issue is judging each other. And Paul is primarily dealing with the Jewish believers who were telling the new Gentile believers they needed to keep the ceremonial holidays. And Paul was saying, in essence, you know, if someone feels a conviction to keep the Day of Atonement or Passover, some of these holidays, keep it under the Lord, but don't compel your brother to keep it. Those laws were shadows. Do you think, do you really picture God or any pastor, any prophet saying, if you want to keep the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath. If you don't, just however you feel, no one's going to judge you. I never heard a pastor preach that sermon about Sunday or Sabbath. Have you? If you want to come, that's fine. If you don't want to come, that's okay. Is that what Paul's saying? Obviously not. He's talking about the Jewish ceremonial Sabbaths. All right. Please explain more about the Sabbath, seventh day. How do we know that the seventh day is Saturday? You know, because uh, people learn the prominent truth about the Sabbath, we get a lot of questions on that, and we're trying to mix them up a little bit. Um, we did cover briefly a number of ways that we can know which day of the week is which day. First of all, if you want to believe the dictionary, the encyclopedia, they're very clear. Sunday is the first day of the week. Saturday is the seventh day of the week. If you want to know which day of our modern time is what we would call the Bible Sabbath or the seventh day of the week. It has never changed from Genesis to the present. And as we said in I think 105 languages of the world, the day for Saturday is called Subota Sabado Sabbath Day, Dia de Reposo. It's the day of rest, is the Sabbath day. Even among some of the Native Americans, they had a seven day week, and guess what day it was when they were colonized? What we would call Saturday, they called the day of God. And so this can be seen all over the world. And then some of the most, I think, compelling evidence is you've got a whole nation of Jews who, of course, they kept the right day every day all through the wilderness because manna came six days a week except what day? Sabbath. Seventh day, Sabbath. All through their experience in the promised land and through their captivity, not only have they retained their original language, they haven't forgotten what day was their Sabbath. And every Christian, when we celebrate the resurrection on the first day of the week, what day of the week is that? There's, everybody's in agreement. No, nobody has any problem about what day of the week is what day until they hear the Sabbath truth. Right? right. Well, the calendars have changed. Well, that's true. Some, you mean devil's advocate tonight? I am. <laughs> Sorry. Some, some of these, um, <laughs> I won't go with tonight's study either. <laughs> some of these uh, work week calendars in the European countries, they actually start their work week Monday. But they change that and they admit it. They did it for work purposes. But even in their dictionaries, it'll call the first day of the week Sunday. Because well, every Easter, what are they going to do? It's still the first day of the week. And the last day is Saturday, Saturday. I want to welcome our friends again. Tonight we have a very important study, and we're actually going to try to cover two very prominent themes of Revelation in one presentation, so you'll have to listen in stereo. The other woman is a follow-up. It's the woman of Revelation 17, or Babylon, a study on Babylon. And then the primary subject tonight is America in Prophecy. And uh, at the website, prophecycode.com, You'll find more information on this, as well as, you know, you can download and listen to programs you may have missed. There are sermon notes, aside from what I cover, with references. People are asking for my notes and scriptures. A lot of that material can be obtained online. Okay. The USA in Bible prophecy. I'm going to begin right off with an amazing fact. Iraq is in the news a lot these days. I think we should be praying about the situation over there. Uh, Mrs. Bachelor and I still have one boy in the Marines. He was there when they invaded. He's home for a while, going back to Japan. But it is a very volatile situation. And it's interesting that aside from Israel, more is said about the country we call Iraq in the Bible than virtually any other land. It was, of course, the home of the Babylonian Empire, we'll talk about tonight, the Assyrian Empire, 
Nineveh, Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization. It's the place that Abraham came out of and Isaac got his wife out of Babylon, brought her to the promised land. Jacob got his wife from Iraq, brought her to the promised land. The children of Israel were twice taken captive by Assyrians and by the Babylonians. And uh, it's, the history books are full, of course, of the seven wonders of the ancient world. We've heard of the hanging gardens of Babylon that King Nebuchadnezzar built for his wife and irrigated by the Euphrates River that dissected the city, massive city, 15 miles on each side. Back at its zenith, it was called the Golden Empire. You remember in our study about uh, what animal represented Babylon? Lion with two wings. Here's an artifact. You can see it's uh, superimposed by the Gate of Ishtar. Uh, um, Saddam Hussein wanted to rebuild some of the parts of the ancient ruins of Babylon and they actually did have the lions with man's faces and two wings as a symbol of their own country. The ancient city was 15 miles on each side, 25 avenues crisscrossing for a total of 676 streets 150 feet across. Uh, you can understand why it was called the Golden Empire. Walls were so wide at the top that one historian, I think it was Herodotus, said that you could ride four chariots side by side, an interstate around the top of the wall. You can understand why Babylonians were not afraid that the Persians would overtake their city because the walls were so fortified. But you know what their Achilles tendon was? The Euphrates River ran under the walls, irrigated the city, and out the other side, Darius the Persian, or the Mede, and Cyrus the Persian diverted the Euphrates River, where it ran under the walls into a dry lake bread. While they were all drunk and partying in the city, the river level went down, the army marched under the walls. Don't miss that, because when you read in Revelation about plague number six, it says the Euphrates River dries up to make the way for the kings of the east. It all links together. Another little amazing fact connected with uh, Babylon. Uh, did you know that Saddam Hussein fancied himself the uh, inheritor of the legacy of Nebuchadnezzar the great king? Matter of fact, I've got one quote here. Saddam had himself photographed not long ago in a replica of the war chariot of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. Of course, this is an older article whom Saddam apparently reveres as a hero despite a bout with insanity which he recovered from. There is a similarity there between Nebuchadnezzar and Saddam with the bout of insanity. Um, which is recounted in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar made his name in history by destroying Jerusalem. Now, Saddam Hussein, many people don't know this, but uh, he was aware that the Jewish prophet Isaiah said that Babylon would never be rebuilt. Isaiah chapter 13, whole prophecy about it would be destroyed and never rebuilt. Some people are wondering if the prophecies in Revelation mean Babylon's going to be rebuilt. It's talking about spiritual Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to prove the Jewish prophet wrong. He wanted to crown himself the heir of Nebuchadnezzar and be the leader of the Arab world. Some of you have read these things. Every time he tried to rebuild Babylon, a war broke out. Isn't that interesting? And he was starting to rebuild it again the second time when the war broke out. I don't think he's going to get a third chance. What do you think? It's interesting when someone tries to overthrow the prophecies of God, uh, they don't succeed, do they? Now this is relevant because you read in Revelation 14, just prior to the coming of Jesus, the second angel's message says, Another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Notice it says Babylon falls twice. Is fallen, is fallen, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We're going to find out a little more about Babylon tonight, but first let's go to question one in the study guide that deals with the first beast in Revelation 13 and then on to the second beast. We've learned uh, there are two world powers in Revelation 13. For a quick review, what is the first beast? Now you remember it says in chapter 13, verse 1, Then I saw, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Notice, having seven heads. How many heads? Seven. Has seven heads, ten horns. How many horns? Ten. And on his horns, ten crowns. And on his heads, names of blasphemy or a blasphemous name. Now, if you jump to Revelation 17, notice what we find there. Verse 3, he carries me away in the spirit. This is Babylon into the wilderness and I see a woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast notice this beast he's um, 
is full of names of blasphemy, having how many heads? Seven heads, ten horns. Notice, seven heads, ten horns, blasphemy. Both beasts. How many of you think that there's a connection between those beasts? Revelation 13, Revelation 17. Difference is in Revelation 17, you've got a woman riding on it. What does a woman represent in prophecy? All right, so I think we're realizing now that uh, this woman is riding on that fallen Roman Empire that had the ten crowns. Seven heads, I'll explain that in a minute. Turn in your Bibles with me, please. Revelation 17. I'm going to do a little reinforcement on that first beast and then go to the second beast because she's mentioned here. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying, Come here, come hither, and I'll show you the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. What color? Scarlet. Who with the... Uh, Names full of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman is arrayed in purple. What color? And scarlet. Adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, boy, forehead comes up a lot in Revelation, doesn't it? On her forehead was written a name, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, do you really think there's some woman walking around in the last days who's got this whole paragraph in her head, dressed like this, riding on a beast, or is this obviously symbolic language? That's why we need these prophetic keys to unlock these things. By the way, the Old Testament prophets of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they talk about Babylon also, as well as uh, even as far back as uh, um, in the books of uh, Genesis, you can find some reference there. I'll tell you more about that later. Now, we're going to go through and look at some of the identifying characteristics of this first beast. Remember, that woman is riding the same first beast you saw in Revelation 13, right? Seven heads, ten horns. First of all, just very quickly to review these things, it says that she's guilty of what? Blasphemy. Both scriptures say this beast is guilty of blasphemy. We've learned blasphemy is putting yourself in position of God or taking the prerogatives that belong to God. Now here's a quote from a book that was a bestseller by Pope John Paul II. Um, I believe that he's a very sincere man. It's called Crossing the Threshold of Hope, but I would have to respectfully disagree with this statement. Confronted with the Pope, and this is on the opening page, confronted with the Pope, one must make a choice. The Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God, who takes the place of the second person, takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. The leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the vicar of Jesus Christ and is accepted as such by believers. Well, basically, it says he's here on earth to take the place of the second person of the Trinity. God the Father first, God the Son second, taking the place of God the Son. I remember Jesus saying I would send the Holy Spirit as my representative. I think it's blasphemous when a man says I am here as the representative of Jesus. Furthermore, it says she's dressed in what color? Purple. And furthermore, purple and scarlet. Purple is a color that represents royalty. And scarlet is a color that represents sin. The Bible says, though the Isaiah chapter 1, though thy sins be as scarlet, you know, who knows here, what does the color blue, while we're talking about Bible symbols, what does the color blue represent in the Bible? Loyalty and the law. You remember that the um, priests would have borders of blue on their garments to help them remember the law of God, where they walked and when they, what they did with their hands. The color blue is missing. The law is missing from this vision that we see. Verse 5, she's called the what? The mother. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's a mother church. A woman represents a church. The term mother, now I'm reading from the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 6, uh, 1909. The term mother church, however, as applied to Rome, has special significance as indicating its headship of all churches. And again, the Catholic Church as mother, Vatican City, one pope, um, one of Pope John Paul II's closest aides has written to bishops worldwide declaring that the Catholic Church is the mother of other Christian churches. In the document, 
Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, told bishops that it was incorrect to refer to Christian churches ranging from Orthodox to Protestant as sister churches. That's wrong. Sisters of the Catholic Church. He says that's wrong. It must be always made clear that the one holy Catholic Church, an apostolic universal church, is not the sister but the mother of all churches. Now, uh, they say that the other Protestant churches came out of us, the other Orthodox churches. We are the mother church, and she embraces that title herself. So, fits that description. It goes on to say in verse 5, she has harlot daughters. Now, you know what's interesting about this? If you know your Old Testament stories, who's the most wicked queen in the Old Testament? Jezebel. We all know that name. Don't ever name your daughter Jezebel. Who knows who Jezebel's daughter was? <coughs> Athaliah. The only two queens that persecuted like they did, Jezebel and her daughter. One of the northern kingdom, one is the southern kingdom. One sort of represents the, the Catholic movement, the other the Protestant movement. And that led the people, women, that led the people away from the worship of Jehovah. Just something for you to think about. How did John the Baptist get killed? Herodias told her daughter... To dance. The mother-the-daughter relationship. Revelation 17 talks about another mother-daughter relationship that persecutes God's prophets. Do you hear echoes of these other stories in the New, old, New and Old Testament in these prophecies of Revelation? That's the key. Uh, something else we put in here from the Daily Telegraph, a Catholic journal, 1999. Disagreement about the extent of the Pope's authority was one of the main causes of the English Reformation in the 16th century. If a new united church was created, it would be the Bishop of Rome who would exercise a universal primacy. The Pope was recognized as the overall authority in the Christian world by the Anglican and Roman Catholic Commission yesterday, which described him as a gift to be received by all the churches. And so they're claiming that we are recognizing that you are the central figure, and if we do have unity, you would be the power, the individual, the office that we would look to. And there's been a number of cases in recent history that bear that out. Uh, answer E, it goes on to say that this, author, this woman in Babylon in chapter 17 of Revelation is also a persecuting power. She persecuted and martyred the saints. We've already probably overdwelt on this, that the Catholic Church, the papacy, freely admits that is part of their history. Uh, the history of the popes, it's written on page 334. Great numbers were driven from their habitations with their wives and children, stripped and naked, many of them inhumanely massacred. Then it goes on. It gets very interesting. We're just reading right out of chapter 17. It says, she sits upon seven mountains. Look up seven in the encyclopedia. You'll see seven wonders of the ancient world and a few things. And then it will say, city of seven hills. What city do you think it talks about when it talks about the city of seven hills? Only one city in the world is known as the city of seven hills. Rome was founded in 753 B.C. on the seven hills, a term used for centuries to describe, oh, I can't say these because I don't speak Italian, Capitoloni, Quirinero, the Minnel, Escortini, that's how they say it in Texas, Calane, Aventine, and Palatine Hills surrounded the old city. They, the translators back there are laughing. Oh, it's okay, I can handle it. <laughs> Verse 18, answer G. She ruled over the kings of the earth. Now, have we seen from history that uh, when the Roman Empire disintegrated into the ten kingdoms, that the kings paid homage to the church during that time, that the supreme power was there at the church. Revelation 17, verse 2, it says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Now, she's called the harlot. Uh, when there is an illicit relationship with a harlot, are there fees that are paid? Are you aware that these nations paid fees to the church? Free will or was it an obligation? They were taxed by the church. Should the church tax the government? Or do you then have the church telling the government, you know, whoever pays the bills tells you what to do. And then they began to dictate uh, how they were supposed to worship. Answer H. Having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations. Central to the Protestant Reformation was a big argument about the Mass, what Christians call the communion. Uh, when I went to Catholic Church, the priest, of course, always held the cup. And here you've got a, the Pope holding a golden cup, and it is central. They believe they have the power, 
The priest has the power to convert that wine, which is fermented, by the way. Most Protestant churches use unfermented grape juice because Jesus said at the Last Supper, I will not drink it again until I drink it with you new. New means unfermented in the Father's kingdom. And anything that is beginning to putrefy is not a good symbol for the blood of Jesus. The bread was to be unleavened. The grape juice was to be unfermented. But it's fermented. And I don't mean to be disrespectful, but when I was a kid and I went to Catholic Church in military school, I was required to go every week. That the priest there would have two or three services for all the different cadets. By the time we got there, he was tipsy. <laughs> I'm absolutely serious. And uh, I think there's a problem with that. It's not a very good witness. But you even look, this is, you know, the Vatican has its own money. And this is a coin that uh, I want to thank Michael Schiffler for sharing this with me. This is 1964 from Vatican City. See, it's a Citadel Vaticano. And there's a woman there. And what is she holding in her hand? Can you see it? It's very small. Not the big purple woman, the one on the coin. They're both holding a cup. And what's coming out of the cup? Sunshine. You'll notice that halos and sun worship is also uh, connected with a lot of the images that you're going to find in the Vatican. Uh, and the halos, do you ever see Jesus and Mary in the Bible ever say they walk around with halos? <laughs> but you'll always see that in the picture because it got a lot of their teachings from the Roman Empire where sun worship was principal. Goes on now, get this. And the woman that you saw, if you have any doubts, last verse of the chapter, if you have any doubts about who this first beast is, we're now in Revelation 17. That woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. All right, help me. Who wrote the book of Revelation? Where was John, the apostle, when he wrote the book of Revelation? He was in Patmos. Was he there freely on vacation or was he a prisoner? Who put him there? Rome. Who was ruling the world? Rome. That woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. Is there any doubt when you start thinking about a woman or church that is in Rome what this beast power is? That's why I read you that litany of Bible scholars that all agreed, and these are the great minds of the church, with what I'm teaching you. I'm not teaching you anything new or original. I'm teaching you what has been lost by the church. And we're trying to rediscover our roots as a Bible people. Number two. In what year was the papacy predicted to lose its world influence? Quick review. We've known and learned that in 1798, uh, after the French Revolution, in connection with that, General Berthier captured the Pope, who died in captivity, both figuratively and literally ending the papal reign that lasted exactly 1,260 years from 538 to 1798. Now, don't miss that date, 1798, because we're going to question three now, and we're going to find out who the second beast is. Got your Bibles? Let's open Revelation 13. I gave you a quick review on Babylon. Do you understand Revelation 17 a little better? Is there any mistaking who it's talking about? Uh, not in my mind. I, I think that even just, come, you could come out of elementary school, read that and know who that is. Chapter 13, and you notice that the second beast, first beast receives a deadly wound by the sword. What does a sword represent? Word of God. And you know what caused more trouble than anything for the papacy was the Bible being printed. First book to come off a printing press was the Gutenberg Bible. And as the Bibles began to multiply, the dark ages began to evaporate because the Bible is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It used to be the Bibles were chained up in the monasteries and only a few priests could read them. The Bible freely went to the people and the beast received a wound by the sword, but it heals. All right. Chapter 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the sea or the earth. Two horns like a lamb. Is a lamb good or bad? Good as a type of Christ. And spoke like a dragon. Starts out like a lamb. Speaks like a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. By the way, we're living right now between verse 11 and 12. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by the signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast that was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark 
in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no one might buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name. doesn't have to be any one. Or, 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 it says. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number. doesn't say the, mar- the number is the mark, does it? Calculate the number. His number is the number of the beast. It is the number of a man. There's a central man at the f- head of this figure, this office. His number is 666. And I think we made a pretty compelling case for that the other day. Amen? Let's move on with our lesson now that we've got the groundwork on the second beast. Uh, I'm just going to tell you now. First beast, once again, represents the papacy based in Europe. Second beast, Protestants, Charismatics, central base is North America. If you didn't know that, who do you think subsidizes most of the mission work around the world today? Protestants and Charismatics in North America. Are you aware of that? Way ahead of every other country as far as money poured into this, uh, the Christian work. Number three, what was predicted to arise around the same time? I'm sorry, which nation was predicted to arise around the same time as the papacy was receiving his deadly wound? It says in Revelation 13, verse 11 and 12, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. All right? Two horns like a lamb, and he speaks like a dragon. What country was starting out as a Christian nation like a lamb right around the time that the papacy received a deadly wound? Only one nation was being born that would become a world power that prophecy would deal with. Are you aware that many of the settlers that came to our country, they were not all conquistadors looking for money. Many of them that came were looking for religious freedom and toleration. And one of the first things the pilgrims did is they knelt down, they prayed, and they prayed over the Bible. It was a very religious group, some of the Puritans and the ones who first landed here. And you know what? Uh, would you like a little amazing fact? First communist socialist country in the world was North America. The pilgrims tried to have a communistic society and they nearly starved to death. They tried to have communal gardens, communal work, and everybody's garden. Nobody wants to work in everybody's garden. And it flopped terribly. In two years, half of them starved to death because it was everybody's garden. They tried communal socialistic living, and it was a terrible mistake. But it was technically communist, if you think about it. But what country was beginning to be born at 1798? A few facts from history. United States declared its independence in 1776, voted the Constitution in 1718, adopted the Bill of Rights in 1791, and was finally recognized as a separate world power by when? 1798. The other countries said, you know, it looks like they really are free of Britain. It looks like they really are up and coming an independent nation. And they began trade with other countries. That was the year. So this other beast begins to rise at the same time. No question about what beast fits that power. Number four, what is the significance of the beast coming up out of the earth? Well, we read earlier in the prophecy, Revelation 17 tells us the waters represent a densely populated area. What new vastly um, open country was in existence at that same time period? It doesn't say that these civilizations rose up out of a densely populated world. And I, I don't want to be disrespectful to my Native American friends. I've lived on the reservation, still care, and I still have a home. That our fence is the reservation fence in a reservation town in Round Valley. And I've lived on the Navajo reservation, the dear friends with the Native American people. But the fact is that pound for pound, people per square mile, there was a lot of land out there. This was not densely populated civilization as they had in the Roman Empire. They had all roads leading to Rome. In that part of the world, there were no roads in this part of the world. So it is a fulfillment of that prophecy. Number five, what is symbolized by the two lamb-like horns and then the absence of crowns? Notice, two horns represents the power, but there are no crowns on the horns. Have we ever had a king? Now, well, of course, the king of England thought he was our king, but not over, no one sat on the throne over here. It represents freedom of religion, freedom of church, freedom of government, freedom of state. What has made this country strong is that we had a government with no king and a church with no pope. There was freedom for people to choose their government leaders and freedom for the people to choose their religion. And that's why it flourished and exploded and it was a new nation. I mean, you just read the plaque on the Statue of Liberty. 
Or go over here to Lincoln Memorial and read the Gettysburg Address and it reinforce what did Lincoln say? This new nation, will it survive? It was exploding with people who are coming seeking what? Freedom. And those principles that really first found root here are now going everywhere, aren't they? Number six, still speaking like a lamb. Oh, and by the way, please don't interpret anything I'm saying tonight as treasonous. I love my country. I am so glad I'm an American. Again, you know, as the same way I said, I'm not trying to pick on our Catholic friends or the papacy. I'm not trying to pick on Americans. When I travel abroad, as much as I love visiting other people and meeting new people and seeing new customs and tasting new food, when Karen and I came back from Russia, we praised God for Taco Bell. <laughs> After six weeks, I mean, you just want to get down and kiss the ground. If you, if, at least that's how I feel. And maybe it's just I'm a little bit patriotic that way. But the prophecies say as much as it hurts me to say it, just as some of our Catholic friends came up after the meeting and they said, Pastor Doug, this really hurts, but we know it's true. And just as it hurts me to say it, our country is not always going to speak like a lamb. Prophecies are telling us that the devil hasn't changed. Does it mean I'm changing my citizenship? No, as long as I'm allowed to practice and preach my convictions, I'm so thankful. Number six, what does it mean when the prophecy in Revelation 13, 11 says America will speak as a dragon? Starts out like a lamb, but it says in verse 11 of chapter 13, he spoke like a dragon. Who's the dragon? It represents the devil. And remember the devil in chapter 12 where the dragon appears is working through the Roman Empire. We're going to speak the same way. All right. I want to talk to you a little bit about the law. How many of you remember this big dispute we had about the Ten Commandments in Alabama in the courthouse? That was a very interesting argument. Personally, you're not asking for my opinion, but I'll give it to you. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with displaying the Ten Commandments because there are displays, historical displays from all different religions all over the country. And even if it was religious, it is obviously a part of American history that we should not uh, be ashamed of. But we do need to be educated about the distinction in the Ten Commandments. When God wrote the Ten Commandments, how many tables did he write them on? Two. As I said before, it was not because he ran out of room on one and said, I better carve another one. He did it on purpose. There is a very clear division in the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal very specifically with our responsibility and worship to God. The last six deal with our relationship to man and they are civil in nature. Let me explain. You don't ever want to be part of a country that mandates from the government how you are to keep the first four commandments. Do you want your government telling you what God to worship? Do you want your government telling you how to go about worshiping him, the technique, whether or not you could pray to idols? Do you want your government telling you what name to call him or what day to worship him? Do you want the government telling you that? But do you want a government that doesn't respect parental authority? Do you want a government that does not respect property rights? that does not respect the institution of marriage, that's the last six commandments. No government should tell its constituents how to keep the first four. This is what Roger Williams started uh, the freedom of religion in our country. He was founded on these principles of you divide the Ten Commandments the way God divided them. You don't want to be part of a country that's telling you how to keep the first four or what you have is a totalitarian uh, dictatorship, a religious dictatorship is what you have. They're telling you how to worship. And can you compel someone to worship God? Our country is not a theocracy. You're not supposed to do that. Freedom of religion. But you don't want to be part of a country that doesn't support the last six. Do you want the government saying, we're going to take care of your children, the parents have no rights? Do you want the government saying, marriage, it doesn't matter? And uh, do you want the government saying, we don't care if people steal your property or kill you? I mean, of course the government has to support the last six. I'm hearing very few leaders on both sides of the question understand where to draw the line. It seems like one group is saying, we need to get the Ten, back, ten Commandments back in government. And they don't hear what they're saying. And then we hear the other group saying, we need to get the Ten Commandments all the way out of government. Aren't you all hearing these things? And they're, they're making a major blunder. They're forgetting our heritage. You've got to know what table of the testimony. You want all ten in the church? Yes. The government needs to represent the civil table. But don't let the government start telling you how to keep the first four commandments because that's what happened in Daniel. The king said, just pray to me. 
He said, pray to the golden image. See what I'm saying? Prophecy is telling us that that's what's going to happen. Government's going to start telling us who and how and what and when to worship. And then you've got trouble in River City, as they say. Once bitter enemies on the theological battlefield, evangelical Protestants and conservative Roman Catholics are finding common ground on the political scene. What is happening is there is a melting, a merging together now of the different major denominations. You've got three principal groups. You've got your Catholics and a number of groups would be in that pocket and then you've got your Protestants and then your Charismatics that are sort of the glue that uh, welds a number of groups together. They're finding common ground on the political scene. And this is a quote from uh, Pat Robertson. Um, you can also find Ralph Reed in his article, Politically Incorrect. Um, he goes on to say, perhaps the most encouraging is the new ecumenism that permeates the pro-family community. The union of the Roman Catholics and conservative, conservative Protestants could have greater impact on American politics than any coalition since the African Americans and the Jews came together during the civil rights movement. They're talking about a moving together of the churches for political purposes. Now, there are certain common things I think it is good for us to join hands on. But what happens is when a pendulum starts to swing and a movement starts to happen, it's often hard to stop where it needs to be. It usually swings too far. And this could swing to the place where the government gets so religious and enthusiastic they start telling us how to worship. Prophecy says it's going to happen. Again, Houston Chronicle, 1994, evangelical Catholics make move for unity. I could give you quote after quote all night long. It would bore you. There are hundreds of quotes in the papers about efforts being made by religious leaders to pull together. And you know what they say? Let's not get divided over doctrine. Let's lay aside our dividing doctrines. Let's join together on the areas where we have common ground. That sounds good. Sounds like a good rally song. The problem with that is there's a very subtle danger is when someone starts telling you to lay aside dividing doctrines, you know why those doctrines are dividing doctrines? Because they're biblical truths and what they're really saying is don't be so specific about biblical truth. Jesus died because he would not lay aside those things. The apostles died and the prophets died because they said those little things do matter. And we've got to know when unity's great and when you've got to say I'm drawing a line when it comes to biblical truth. I'm not compromising truth for unity. <laughs> and that's going to be the appeal. And as soon as you stand up and say I'm not going to compromise my convictions for ecumenical unity, they're going to say well you're just a rebel, you're against unity and you're going to be ostracized and scandalized, and uh, it's going to happen. October 31st, 1999, narrowing a major divide that has separated Roman Catholics and Lutherans since the 16th century. This was historic, because you know how the Lutherans formed. Martin Luther, of course, was the, the lead Protestant, was a Catholic priest, broke away because he said, you're not following the Bible. He tried to reform the church, but didn't want reforming. So he broke away, and they formed the Lutheran church, and based on, you know, the whole Protestant Reformation was the Bible and the Bible only. And worlds apart, they used to be in their doctrines. Poor Martin Luther, if he knew what had happened, would roll over in his grave. Catholics and Protestants and Lutherans and Catholics joining hands and saying, let's not worry about the specifics anymore. You know how many people died because of those specifics? The United States largest Lutheran church on Tuesday endorsed a joint declaration on how many humans are saved from eternal damnation. They began to put aside the differences and how many of you remember when uh, they went and they nailed a new 95 theses on the door so that the Catholics and Lutherans could join together again and there was a big ceremony made about that. So the big push is for this ecumenical unity and uh, I'm very thankful for the work that some of these groups are doing. You know, Promise Keepers does a great work. But one of the things that you'll hear at many of those rallies is all these men get together and they say, let's just break down the walls that divide us and let's just say the name of Jesus. And I remember, oh, was it Max Lucado? He said, everybody, when I count to three, say your denomination. And he said, one, two, three, and everybody said the denomination. It sounded like Tower of Babel. He said, now when I count to three, everybody say Jesus. And he counted to three and everyone said, Jesus. And it was inspiring. But really what he was saying is, Let's just unite on Jesus and forget about the denominational truths that divide us. 
It sounds so good, but there's a very subtle danger with that. You can't be asked to be part of that without sacrificing convictions about the Bible. And as far as you and I can get along, brother, I want to get along. But when you ask me to say no to what truth is, I've got to draw the line. Amen. Truth doesn't change. Truth cannot be negotiated. It cannot be compromised. It doesn't shift. Jesus said it's like a rock. The storm may beat against it, but it doesn't move. And we've got to know when to put our roots down and take a stand. Book by Keith Fournier, A House United, Evangelicals and Catholics Together. A uh, quote from Pat Robertson. I think this is uh, the early part of the 90s. And, uh, and actually, he's not a prophet, but this came true. I believe the emerging alliance of the partnership between Catholics and evangelical Protestants is going to be the most powerful force for the electorate in the 1990s and beyond. And anybody that ignores that alliance is going to make a, make a big mistake. And of course, the pundits all agree that one of the main forces in the last two elections, including the recent one in 2004, was the religious factor. Am I right? Isn't that what they're saying in the news? It is becoming more and more a political issue. Number seven, what specifically will America do that will cause it to speak as a dragon? It says in Revelation 13, verse 12, He exercises all the power of the first beast before him. Now, when did the first beast become a beast? The church in Rome made a lot of compromises, but it wasn't until they began to use an army that Justinian had given the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, to start compelling people to worship a certain way or they'd be punished. Did Jesus ever use physical force to get people to follow him? See, it's a complete uh, detour from the principles of Christ's teaching when that happens. The church and the state will unite and enforce religious practices. That's what happened all through the Dark Ages. During the rule of the papacy from 538 to 1798, they used force to compel people to worship a certain way. When they did not cooperate, they could be tortured, they could be killed, their property could be taken away, they could be driven into the hills. Read the history about the Albigenses, the Waldenses, the Hussites. I think we've forgotten our history and someone once said, if you do that, you're doomed to repeat it. And I'll predict we're going to repeat it. The Old Testament history is being repeated right now. A nation, how does the second beast speak like a dragon? A nation speaks through its laws or its legislative body, right? It's not the superstars and the sports heroes that are speaking in behalf of the nation, are they? It's what does the government say? What are the laws? You know, I think it's very interesting. If you go to Rome, remember this. The papacy received its seat from the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire ruled by Caesars. As it began to crumble and Rome fell, at the same time it was waning, the papacy, the church, was waxing stronger. And they adopted many of the collective religions of ancient Roman Greece. The architecture of the papacy and their institutions, is a lot of it is Romanesque. Would, would you agree with that? If you walked around Washington, D.C. very in the very recent history... <laughs> I mean, you can see a lot of similarities between the, uh, the Capitol and the, uh, the Vatican and some of the architecture. You know, somebody reminded me that uh, I think my friend Joe Maniscalco, the artist, was doing a study on sun worship. This is very interesting. He was doing a study on sun worship around the world. And if you go to the Vatican, and by the way, Joe Maniscalco was raised a Catholic, and so he was very interested in this. You can see solar disks and solar wheels are like eight-spoked wheels and sun disks. It represents the rays of the sun all over the Vatican, all over the Roman churches. You've seen them in halos. You see the sign, the symbol everywhere. Uh, you know where the biggest solar disk in the world is? It's in the Vatican. See in the courtyard there? And in the middle of the Vatican is an obelisk. Do you know where the biggest obelisk in the world is? Not far from here. It's the Washington Monument. And the second beast will make an image to the first beast that had a deadly wound and was healed. Did ancient Rome have a senate? Do we? What calendar do we use? Gregorian calendar, named after Pope Gregory. And the months, you know where they get their names? They're the Roman names for the months. They're all messed up. For instance, uh, July is named after Julius Caesar. 
And Augustus Caesar was bothered that Julius Caesar had more days in his month, and so he wanted a month that was just as long, so he took some days from February. And that's why August has got that. And February is so short. That's right, the Caesars did that. And if you know anything about Roman numerals, um, Septimo or Sep September is supposed to be the seventh month, right? What month is it? Ninth month. October. Ocho. Octagon. It's supposed to be the eighth month. It's the tenth month. Nueve. November. It's supposed to be the ninth month. It's the eleventh month. Deca. December. It's supposed to be the tenth month. It's the twelfth month. They messed with the calendar. It really got everyone confused. And biblically, the days begin and end at sundown. They started telling time from midnight. Well, that was after they developed clocks that could do that. The days of the week are Roman names. Sunday was the day of principal worship in Rome, the day of the sun. The venerable day of the sun is what Constantine called it. Monday was moon day. I mean, the influence of ancient Rome on even North America is astounding when you start to study it. And that second beast will make an image to the first beast that had a wound by the sword that was healed. In the same way that ancient Rome was the undisputed leader militarily and in many other ways of the ancient world, who would you say is the world leader in those respects today? The United States of America. We're going to say more about that. Over what specific issues will force be utilized and the death sentence passed? Answer, and he would cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. A death sentence if you don't worship the way you're being told. It's all dealing with what? Worship. The word worship appears many times just in chapter 13. Worship, worship, worship. And so when you hear us talk about the Sabbath truth, what is it all about? It's what God you worship and what day you worship Him. It's the one commandment that principally deals with this, the day of worship. You know, uh, in the book Evangelicals and Catholics Together, another book talking about the press for unity by Chuck Colson. I've met him, a nice guy. More generally, the spread of the charismatic movement and then their songs, prayers, and worship styles going well beyond official charismatic circles has done a great deal to reduce the barriers between Catholics and evangelicals. The worship styles, the day of worship, is all helping to weld these people together. You know what I'm discovering? And the reason I've dedicated my life to do these seminars? The average Christian in North America is biblically illiterate now. If they don't get it from the radio or television preacher, they don't know what's going on. Very few people wake up and read their Bible for themselves and study their Bible comparing Scripture with Scripture. I hope these meetings are inspiring you to spend some time in Bible study. Amen, friends? Amen. And it's all about the experience of worship because we're so used to being entertained. We want to go to church and feel good instead of going to learn and sit at the feet of Jesus as He opens the Word we want to, you know, be entertained. We want to be made to feel something. And all the emphasis is being put on getting people to come to church for the experience, what's in it for us. It used to be we came to worship God because He's God, because He's our Creator, not because of what we're going to get out of it. But the whole attitude has changed. And everything is about the worship experience. He goes on on page 172, and he says, Billy Graham's cooperative evangelism in which all the churches of an area are involved to share in one charismatic gathering where the distinction between Protestants and Catholic vanishes. I've seen those. I've been to them. Uh, and Christ-centered fellowship and joy is another example. In other words, let's put aside the differences and come together for common worship. Very subtle. But I know what the end of that's going to be. Christianity Today. Notice this. Harold Linzel. All businesses, including gasoline stations and restaurants, should close every Sunday by force of legislative fiat through the duly elected officials of the people. In other words, it should be mandated. Uh, more and more, there's voices that are speaking up saying it should be forced by the government to tell us to worship. God can't bless our country because we're not worshiping when he tells us to worship on Sunday, what they call the Lord's Day. Pat Robertson's book, The New World Order, the author there says... The next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes to himself, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is the command of the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandate a day of rest, Sunday laws, have been nullified as a violation of church and state. In other words, he says it's awful how the Sunday laws have evaporated. There used to be laws in our country telling people about work on Sunday. 
and as an outright insult to God and his plan. Only those policies that can be shown to have a clearly secular purpose are recognized. He goes on then to say, it is not the duty of any particular group of people, it is not the duty of the church, but it is the duty of the government of the people to thus proclaim as a, a day as Sabbath to be universally observed throughout the length and breadth of the land. Sunday, he says, it should be enforced by the government. And don't underestimate the clout that he has. There are a lot of people in leadership that believe this. Sunday as the Lord's Day. If we as a nation would escape the doldrums of increased trouble as God's hand rests heavily upon this people, opposition to Sunday nationally declared must cease. It needs to be supported by the government. Do you hear that? Am I reading anything into that? Maybe this is plain enough for you. I think some of us have heard of Reverend Jerry Falwell. All Americans would do well to petition the President and the Congress to make a federal law and an amendment to the Constitution, if need be, to establish the Sabbath as a national day of rest. You think he's talking about the Seventh-day Sabbath? No. And Chief Justice William Rehnquist said, The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. He's not altogether wrong on that, but these are the sentiments that tell us which way the wind is blowing, friends. And I think we're on the verge of prophecy being fulfilled. What do you think? Yes. Could a government really control buying and selling? What does it say in Revelation 13? That those that don't worship the way they're being told to worship will not be allowed to buy and sell. Anyone here remember World War II? I mean, were you alive then? Eh, maybe you don't want to raise your hand. I know some of our friends watching, uh, food and gas ration stamps were a common thing. Could they control buying and selling? In times of crisis, it's very common for the government to do that. Cannot buy or sell unless he cooperates. Anyone here ever heard of economic sanctions? Keep in mind, these prophecies in Revelation are talking about government powers. And so when it says those that do not cooperate cannot buy or sell, it's not just talking about the local person who wants to go to the market with their ATM and buy something. It's talking about governments of the world that do not cooperate with this universal worship that will be forced, will be locked out economically from the new world order, whatever they're going to call it, I don't know. Is it already happening where they use economic sanctions? Yeah, and it can be devastating when they blockade, I mean, you know, the chief producers of the products of the world are the nations that buy into these two powers, Europe, North America, even Australia is tied into Europe. They recognize the queen, right? And just about every other country in the world is some way tied into one of these powers. Question number 10, how strong and influential is the papacy today? Now, here's some amazing quotes. Some of you remember when this came out in Time magazine that after Reagan's tenure as president, it was revealed that he did conspire with Pope John Paul II. It was called the Holy Alliance. They worked to undermine the communism and quite successfully. This is from Carl Bernstein in that article. Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake a clandestine campaign to hasten the dissolution of the communist empire. They started in Poland with the solidarity. Some of you remember Lech Walesa. And it was a conspiracy to bring down communism. Did it work? Are they powerful? Is the papacy in the United States a powerful entity to consider? Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake this campaign to hasten the dissolution. It goes on to say, uh, the U.S. ambassador to the Vatican, I believe the United States as the world's only superpower and the Holy See, that's the papacy, as the only worldwide moral political sovereignty have significant roles to play in the future. Their actions will impact the lives of people in all parts of the globe. And I think we've made a strong case for that. And I could just show you one picture after another of the presidents all the way back from uh, JFK to the present meeting with Pope John Paul II or Pope uh, Paul. Um, so this uh, union stretching across the abyss, is it happening? I think we've seen it very clearly. Question 11. How strong and influential is the United States today? The second beast, does it have the power? to urge other countries to cooperate? Yeah, first of all, just consider for a minute. Economically, Wall Street is the dynamo of the economy of the world. Is that true? Amen? Amen. Friends who are watching, you agree? I see you nodding. The media, superpower, North America, produces more than anybody else. Computer technology, 
medical technology. And you can go right down the line for the, the great methods of communication. It's the center for those things, the very powerful influences. What about military might? Would we agree that while we may not have the greatest number of soldiers, the technology and the power of the weapons possessed by the United States is unsurpassed. And with the breakup of the Soviet Union, and they don't have that consolidation that they had before, uh, and even since the first Gulf War, America has pretty much been recognized by the world as the ultimate superpower. And everybody's looking to us now to help police what's happening everywhere in the world. Number 12, is it clear that the influence and power of both the United States and the papacy are escalating with rapidity? What other factors could possibly help set the stage for a worldwide law to execute those who refuse to violate conscience? What does it say in Luke 21, verse 25? And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things that are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then it goes on to say, and then they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Something's going to happen, signs in the sun and the moon, men's hearts failing for fear. Something is going to frighten. Will it be an economic collapse? I think that'll probably be part of it. Might be a terrorist act, could be a natural disaster. You know, it's interesting. It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. They've had this whole list of movies where the world's destroyed by asteroids and tidal waves and Godzilla and aliens. And I mean, it's just one thing after another. And I remember at 9-11 when I uh, got a call from Bonnie, told to turn on the, uh, the news and saw what was happening. My first reaction was, is this special effects? Is this Hollywood? Is this really happening? It was so cataclysmic and look how we changed from that one event did we lose some freedoms did people's hearts start failing for fear it could be another terrorist act I talked to you about some of the missing nuclear weapons from the dissolution of the former Soviet Empire could be a natural disaster I don't know exactly one thing I do know history tells us that virtually every dictatorship has come into power on the heels of economic disaster Napoleon did it Kaiser Wilhelm did it. Hitler did it. There could be some economic disaster. People are ready to listen to a dictator if he says he's going to pit, put a chicken in every pot, right? We've seen that in history. That was the slogan of one politician. Number 13. As world conditions worsen, what will Satan do to deceive the masses? Answer. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles that go out under the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Is the devil able to create illusions? Can he appear sometimes as an angel of light and deceive people? Uh, maybe he could appear as a Marian apparition and give orders and deceive people. I mean, there's a lot of things that uh, he could do. Out of the mouth of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Revelation tells us the dragon is the devil. The devil wanted to be God. The beast is the papacy. We've already quoted. He wanted to be the sun. Puts himself in the place of the sun. Charismatic movement. Big emphasis on the Holy Spirit. We can control the spirit and direct the spirit. It's almost like a counterfeit. Father, son, and Holy Spirit. Number 14. While interest in the counterfeit revival, and don't misunderstand, I believe in the genuine gifts of the Spirit. Everyone clear on that? I'm talking about the counterfeit now. What will be happening at the same time to the genuine worldwide revival sponsored by God's end time people? It tells us that after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, Revelation 18 verse 1, having great authority and the earth was illuminated with his glory. God's light is going to go from all over the world. You know what I think is interesting? He sees these angels flying in the midst of heaven and you know the satellites that are being used right now to ricochet this message down to earth. Have you ever looked at them? They've got these great big solar wings that catch the sun's power and convert it to electricity. I wonder what a prophet in Bible times would call that if he saw it. I was out camping in the Nevada desert one day and watching these satellites go over and they look like angels. It just makes you wonder. And the message is bouncing off of those uh, transistor angels, isn't it? God's people are going to have a great revival. 
Bible says where sin abounds, there does grace much more abound. And at the same time, the devil is trying to deceive. God is going to pour out his genuine spirit and there will be a revival. And you know how you can always tell the difference between the true revival and the counterfeit revival? Don't miss this. If you want to know the difference, the true revival will bring holiness into the life. A turning away from sin, an exalting of Jesus and his law, surrender of self, a turning away from materialism, these preachers that are telling you just you follow me name it and claim it and God wants you to be healthy wealthy and wise is that the message of Jesus I think that's very suspect number 15 in desperation the US led coalition will next decide to impose a death sentence on the enemies Revelation 13 verse 5 what does Revelation uh, 14 say the leaders will do they go to convince people that God is with them and he does great wonders so that he can make fire come down from heaven on the side of men to deceive them. Did the devil bring fire down from heaven in the book of Job? Yeah. And then that dwell on the earth will be and deceive those that dwell on the earth by the power of the miracles he had uh, the ability to predict. Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14. And no wonder for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Will Satan seek to impersonate Jesus? Didn't the Lord tell us there will be false Christs There'll be real prophets in the last days and false ones. Jesus is going to pour out his spirit, but they'll be counterfeit. God came to the earth in the form of a man to save us. The devil is going to counterfeit that. Amen? They'll show great signs and wonders. Whereas if it's possible to deceive even the very elect, it will be so compelling and so convincing. Friends, how are you going to not be deceived? The only safe way, number 16, for us to prevent being deceived is what? How can we prevent it? Answer, Isaiah 8, verse 20. According to the law and the testimony, the law and the prophets, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, the Bible, that's the only way we're going to know. Amen, friends? Amen. He goes on to say, if they don't go by the law and the testimony, there is no light in them. Finally, Revelation 3, verse 10. There's a promise for you. Write that down, friends. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Do you want God to keep you? It says keep his commands. You don't need to be afraid, friends, of what is coming. We can have peace during this time. We are living on the threshold of the end right now. And that's why God has brought you. He wants you to know he has a big plan for your life. He's got an eternal plan for your life. But ultimately, that comes from first accepting Jesus, the Prince of Peace, into your heart. And I'd like to invite you to pray, friends. Knowing these things won't save you. The only thing that will give us peace through the storm is accepting Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen? He's brought you. He's wanting you to know the truth because the truth will set you free. Jesus not only wants you to be aware of what's happening in the world politically, He wants you to be aware of what's happening in your heart spiritually. He's calling you. He's knocking in Revelation chapter 3. He's knocking on the door of your heart. But He says, you must open the door and let Him in. Would you like to make a decision tonight to let him in and you can have peace no matter what happens in the world if you know you have Jesus in your heart is that your desire friends Father in heaven thank you for the promise that he that has the son has life we would like to invite Jesus the prince of peace into our hearts tonight and while there might be fear and turmoil in the world around us as long as we know that Christ is with us we are a majority and we're not afraid Bless these dear people with that experience. Help them to experience Christ in them, the hope of glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.